Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over how to fail at almost everything and still win big by Scott Adams. He's really the creator of Dilbert and this is kind of his life story but as you can see down in the cover here it says some of the simplest and most profound advice and this is really going to be important for any of you who are trying to create something with your life trying to follow through on some of the dreams that you might have had as when you were a little kid. I think Scott Adams really does give a lot of simple and profound advice inside this book. Now let's quickly get into the introduction. I'll tell you a little bit about who Scott Adams actually is. As I said before, he's the creator of the Dilbert cartoons. He's a full-time cartoonist since 1995 after 16 years spent working as a technology worker. He's created over 9,000 comic strips. He's got best-selling books, which are in including this one, The Dilbert Principle and Dogbert's Top Secret Management Handbooks. And the quote that I pulled from the book about how to fail at almost anything and still win big, almost everything and still win big, sorry, um, was that he says, when I was in my 20s, I didn't know anyone who could tell me how to become a cartoonist, how to write a book or how to become successful in general. And I think a lot of us can probably relate to that exact Sentiment. We don't really know anyone who's doing what we want to be doing. He continues on and he says, This was a big obstacle to my success. It seemed as if other people were benefiting greatly from the wisdom of their friends and families. That is exactly the sort of inequality that pisses me off and motivates me at the same time. And I think a lot of us can relate to that as well. As a result, I've spent decades trying to figure out what works and what doesn't on the topic of success. If you want to be successful in just about any field, let me be your starting point. I'll describe over the course of this book a sort of a template for success that can serve as a launching pad. I won't always have the right formula for your specific situation, but I can help you narrow down your choices. And I think that's exactly what this book is about. It's essentially he's trying to create this launching pad for us, for the people that he's trying to write to. and give us a way that's really the roadmap to success. Now, again, the world is changing at a very fast pace. You won't always have the right formula for our specific situation, but a lot of these principles can be used in order to help us in our specific situation. I think that's what this book is really good at. So let's talk about the obstacle to success. Are you trying to achieve something that no one you know has actually achieved? Now, this part can be extremely difficult, not only just because it would be nice if you had an in with some people in the industry, but also because if you don't know anyone, you don't know the path in order to actually achieve that thing. It's a little less difficult now that we have the internet, but we also have other problems because of the internet. We have people who are mentors and coaches who haven't actually done the thing that you were looking to achieve. So it can be a little disheartening when you find someone who's giving you advice that actually isn't that useful. But the good news is that there are a lot of core lessons of success that are transferable. And essentially, this is what Scott has given us in this book. He's probably the most successful person in his field, maybe of all time. Now, I'm not a huge comic book reader, so maybe I'm way off on that, but that's what I would have to say. I've read his comics, and I can't remember any other comics that I've read. That, in and of itself, is a very impressive feat. But when you look at the field, it's creative and extremely competitive. Two things that people really have a lot of trouble with are competing in a competitive field and also creating something that people actually want to consume. Learning these principles is what Scott says helped lead him to his success. And a lot of the principles, I think, maybe were learned retroactively, but they definitely help us. We can kind of learn from his experience. The book is, as you could guess, very funny, and even though it's packed with very important information. I enjoyed the writing style, and I'm sure you will too. Pick up the book if you have the chance, and let's get into the actual meat of the book, some of the ideas that I pulled out. First, it's about systems, and if you know me at all, I'm a systems guy. I love creating these mind maps because they're essentially systems of how I think about the books, and I can look back at these videos, and I can say, oh, I remember that point. That's such a good point, and it also connects to all these other books that I've read before, and you can see me making those sorts of connections in the book to try and help make connections for you as well. So the first quote says, you could word glue goals and systems together if you chose. All I'm suggesting is that thinking of goals and systems as different concepts has power. This is very powerful. 
goal-oriented people exist in a state of continuous pre-success failure at best. And that's a very interesting point, right? People who have set goals, even if they're working towards those goals, can sometimes feel like, oh, I'm still a failure because I haven't achieved that goal. And permanent failure at worst if things never work out. Systems people succeed every time they apply their systems. In the sense that they did what they intended to do, the goals people are fighting the feeling of discouragement at every single turn. The systems people are feeling good every time they apply their systems. That's a big difference in terms of maintaining your personal energy in the right direction. The systems versus goals model can be applied to most human endeavors. In the world of dieting, losing 20 pounds is a goal, but eating right is the system. In the exercise realm, running a marathon in under four hours is a goal, but exercising daily is a system. In business, making a million dollars is the goal, but a serial entrepreneur is the system. So essentially what he's saying is systems and goals are really two different things. And if we want to be successful, we are going to have to create good systems and also follow those systems. And it has this added benefit of, let's say you set a goal and you don't quite achieve it, you feel bad about yourself. But let's say you have a system and you continually put that system into place you can kind of give yourself a little bit of a pat on the back every single time you put that system into place. He continues on, he says, for our purposes, let's say a goal is a specific objective that you either achieve or don't sometime in the future. A system is something that you do on a regular basis that increases your odds of happiness in the long run. If you do something every single day, it's a system. And if you're waiting to achieve something someday in the future, it's a goal. To put it bluntly, goals are for losers. And that's the type of thing that he's going to say quite a lot in the book. And I appreciate it because that sentence really kind of sums up this whole entire point on systems. Now, systems versus goals. What are some of my thoughts on systems versus goals? Systems are things that you're going to do on a consistent basis. Generally, you set up systems in order to achieve a certain goal. That's the way that I look at it, at least. You set a goal. You say, I want to achieve this. What's the best system in order to help me achieve that goal? And how can I put that into place in my life? But the cool thing is that you get to win every time you implement your system rather than only winning when your goal is achieved. And now it's just a psychological win, but that's really what's going to motivate us through our lives is these tiny psychological wins, this brain candy of us continually inputting a system that we know is going to lead to our success. Goals are the end point of achievement, right? Generally, you set a goal that you would like to achieve based on the vision you see for your life. As Scott says here, the problem with goals is that it's very difficult to stay motivated when you might not achieve them anytime soon. So self-coaching course philosophy, let's talk about that. Similar to what Scott says here, I've noted, I've noted the systems versus goals phenomenon in my own life for quite some time. Setting goals and focusing too intently on them would get me in the mindset of I can't wait to accomplish this or even the mindset of I can't be happy, I haven't accomplished that yet, right? How many of you have felt like that before? So both of those mindsets don't lend themselves to lasting success. And I think that's absolutely the truth. So what I've done instead is I've taken inside my self-coaching course is I'm setting a vision for your life. Instead of a goal, we set a vision for your life. And after we've set your vision, instead of setting goals, we develop a system you can implement and follow daily that will lead you to achieving your vision. It's a much more fulfilling and sustainable way to achieve anything that you're looking to achieve. So first question to ask yourself is, where is your focus? Are you obsessing over achieving goals or are you focusing on implementing the system that will help you achieve that goal? More about systems and goals is in Atomic Habits by James Clear. I really, really like that book and I suggest that you go and check out the mind map video that I've done on that book already. So big idea or the point number two is don't wish. He says, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard goes something like this. If you want success, figure out the price and then pay it. It sounds trivial and obvious, but if you unpack the idea, it has extraordinary power. I know a lot of people who wish they were rich and famous or otherwise fabulous. They wish they had yachts and servants and castles and they wish they could travel the world in their own private jets. But these are mere wishes. Few of these wishful people have decided to have any of the things that they wish for. Decided to wish to have any of the things that they wish for. It's a key difference. For once you decide, you take action. Wishing starts in the mind and generally stays there. When you decide to be successful in a big way, it means you acknowledge the price you're willing to pay. And you pay it. 
Successful people don't wish for success. They decide to pursue it. And to pursue it effectively, they need a system. Success always has a price, but the reality is the price is negotiable. So this is where we're talking about if you pick the right system, the price will be a lot nearer to what you're willing to pay. I can't change the fact that success requires a lot of hard work, but if you learn to appreciate the power of systems over goals, it might lower the price of success just enough to make it worth a go. And that's what I was talking about before, but choosing the right system. It's not just about systems, it's about choosing the system that's gonna most likely lead you towards being able to achieve what you're hoping to achieve. So we need to talk about paying the price because once we've decided on our goal and once we've decided on the best system to get us towards our goal, we really need to think about paying the price. We need to get busy paying the price. And what you can think about is, are you stuck in wishing mode? right this is the mode where our minds naturally grav gravitate towards unless we train them this mode keeps us in safety and makes sure we don't fail but we still kind of get that dopamine hit of feeling like we want to achieve something but it also makes sure that we don't succeed so here's a three-step process to break wishing number one figure out what you want number two figure out the price or develop the system and number three just get busy paying it and focus on paying it every single day. So creating a system to pay the price will make it much, much easier to actually get things to done, get things done. Looking at the hundreds of hours in the gym or the total pounds to lose will cause the price to seem much, much higher. But looking at 30 minutes a day of moderate exercise and walking after dinner instead of snacking makes the price seem much smaller and you just have to pay it every single day. So very interesting, right? Create a good system and then make sure that you get busy paying it instead of continuing to wish. The next point is about productive hours. This is going to be very important if you're doing any kind of um, self-driven work. He says that one of the most important tricks for maximizing your productivity involves matching your mental state to the task. So for example, when I first wake up, my brain is relaxed and creative. The thought of writing a comic is fun and it's relatively easy because my brain is in the exact right mode for that task. I know from experience that trying to be creative in the mid-afternoon is a waste of time. By 2 o'clock p.m., all I can do is regurgitate the ideas that I've seen elsewhere. But at 6 a.m., I'm a creator, and by 2 a.m., I'm a copier. Everyone is different, but you'll discover that most writers either work early in the morning or past midnight. That's when the creative writing juices flow most easily. And I think creativity doesn't just necessarily have to be around writing. It could be about business. It could be about creating these mind maps and etc. But the real gem inside that quote is to find your rhythm. Everyone has certain hours that they're more productive in. And essentially what you need to do is just find what those hours are for you. For some people, their hours might be early in the morning, like me. For others, it could be late at night. Less important is what hours they are, but that you know your own personal rhythm and you can stick to it or get yourself to stick to it. How can you build your schedule around your rhythm? So let's say, for example, you are an early morning type person. How can you get yourself to wake up early and actually get right to work? Or let's say that you're a late night person. How can you make it so that your schedule is clear late at night so that you can do your work? Can you do your most important and creative work early? Or can you schedule meetings and more monotonous type tasks later on in the day, right? Just because you're a copier at 2 p.m., doesn't necessarily mean that you should stop working altogether at 2 p.m. If you have things to get done that a copier would be good at, go ahead and do them at that time, or at least schedule them at that time. So let's talk a little bit about my schedule, how I schedule my day. So creating these mind maps and videos is an early morning thing for me. I wake up early and I get right to work as my creative energy rapidly declines. Reading is more of a nighttime thing for me, so I often will read for one to two hours before bed before watching, rather than watching TV. And coaching is by itself much more reflective and calm activity, something I'm much better at in the afternoon after drinking some relaxing tea. So that's kind of how I schedule my day. I do a lot of these creative works in the morning and then afternoon I start getting into some coaching with people and maybe doing a few copier type tasks if I have to. And then at nighttime I really start to try and calm down because I know I can work myself up at nighttime and not be able to sleep. Now, after productivity hours, right, productive hours, after you've kind of decided that, you have to figure out how to put that into your routine. And Scott says of routines, he says, Barry Schwartz, the author of The Paradox of Choice, tells us that people become unhappy if they have too many options in life. The problem with options is that choosing any path can lead you, leave you plagued with self-doubt. 
you quite rationally think that one of the paths not chosen might have worked out better. Choosing among attractive alternatives can also be exhausting. You want to feel as if you researched and considered all your options. That's why I find great comfort in routine. If you ask me today where I will be at 6.20 a.m. on Saturday morning in the year 2017, I'll tell you I will be at my desk finishing the artwork on some comics I drew earlier in the week. That's what I was doing last Saturday and that time, and I will plan to do this this Saturday as well. I can't recall the last time I woke up and looked at my options for what to do first. It's always the same, at least for the first few hours of my day. I never waste a brain cell in the morning trying to figure out what to do when. Compare that with some people who you know who spend two hours planning and deciding for every task that takes one hour to complete. I'm happier than those people. So essentially what he's saying here is don't start planning first thing in your morning because you're ruining your creative energy. You're taking all that energy that should be used on creative pursuits and on pursuits that are going to move the needle in your happiness and you're spending it on time planning those things. So instead of really kind of knowing your productive hours and then being all random about what you're doing inside those productive hours, you need to find your rhythm and create a routine. So once you've found that natural energetic rhythm, it's important to create a routine. Scott points out here that attention and willpower are both limited resources. You don't want to waste them by forcing your brain to make decisions that are best decided once. After finding your rhythm and deciding it on your routine, it's important to let the habit take over, right? So this is essentially what routine is, is a habit. Habits are a wonderful facet of the human mind. They simply allow us to conserve energy. While we often think of them as bad habits, they are serving a purpose. You've decided on your routine and the brain is simply making it easy for you to follow that routine. Hint, if you change your routine for long enough, your habits will change as well. And again, here I want to recommend checking out Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a powerful way to get you to stick to your ideal routine. Now, our next point is moist robots. And the quote this comes from, he says, your brain is wired to continuously analyze your environment, your thoughts and your health, and to use that information to generate a sensation that you call your attitude. This is getting to the mental aspect of working and creating the life that we want. You know from experience that you do better work and you more enjoy life when your attitude is good. If you could control your attitude directly, as opposed to letting the environment dictate how you feel on any given day, it would be like a minor superpower. It turns out that you have that superpower. You can control your attitude by manipulating your thoughts, your body, and your environment. Your attitude affects everything you do in your quest for success and happiness. A positive attitude is an, an important tool. It's important to get it right. The best way to manage your attitudes is by understanding your basic nature as a moist robot that can be programmed for happiness if you understand the user interface. Right? I'm going to say that again because I think that's such an important point. Understand that your basic nature is as a moist robot that can be programmed for happiness if you understand the user interface. Exercise, food, and sleep should be the first buttons that you push. Right? Exercise, food, and sleep so important for happiness. So let's talk about changing your attitude. Now that we know that we're moist robots and we're going to be able to remember this point, how do we actually go about changing our attitudes? Well, first you have to ask, what's currently dictating how you feel? Most people allow their environment to control how they feel. But a way better superpower we all have access to is to control your attitude yourself. Mindfulness and meditation are a great place to start. And Sam Harris shows us in his book, Waking Up, how our mind works. He shows us how our thoughts control our emotions and how we are all not actually our thoughts. Mindfulness is a large topic to get into for this mind map, and this is not about mindfulness, but I recommend that you check that mind map out along with the Atomic Habits mind map. And with that, let's talk about your control panel. The first buttons that Scott recommends that we push in order to get us into a good state, in a state that we feel happy and that we are more magnetized kind of towards success is to get good exercise habits, to get good food habits, to get good sleep habits. And really this is kind of just a good time to check in for you. How are those areas in your life? So meditation would fit in the rest or sleep category. And I, I think that it would be extremely powerful. In fact, if it's me, I would much rather wake up 30 minutes early and do 30 minutes of meditation than get an extra 30 minutes 
of sleep. So now that we've decided on our systems, we've realized that we have to actually pay the price instead of wishing. We've got our productive hours and a rhythm and routine created for ourselves. We understand that we are the ones that are in control of our own minds and our own happiness. The final point is consistency. And the real good quote about consistency that he puts in here, he says, if you want to make a habit of something, the worst thing that you can do is pick and choose which days of the week that you do it on and which ones that you don't. Exercise becomes a habit when you do it every day without fail. Taking rest days between exercise breaks up the pattern that creates habit. It also makes it too easy to say, today is one of your non-exercise days, and maybe tomorrow too. I exercise at lunchtime because mornings are better for my creative work, and afternoons are unpredictable in terms of work and family time. Other successful exercisers get up long before the sun to do their workouts, and still others go straight from work to the gym. In each case, the key is to have a predictable system. The method that never succeeds is exercising whenever you have spare time at home. If you're like most adults, you haven't had spare time in years. So key principles of habit building. The number of times that you do a habit really matters. Therefore, doing an activity every single day helps speed up the time frame in which it becomes a habit. Scott also talks about how doing an activity every day doesn't allow a break in the pattern, which is also useful in order to keep habits. So think about which habits you're trying to build and how can you use those two principles in your life? How can you do them every single day? And how can you link that habit to something that you already do every single day? That's another kind of insider tip from Atomic Habits by James Clear. The best way to start a habit is to link it to something. Overcome that little voice in your head by saying, this is just what we do now, buddy. And I really like that kind of parenting yourself. Hey buddy, this is just what we do now we'll get over it. We, we really are going to be better because of this routine that we're starting. Now, I want to thank you for being with me today on how to fail at almost everything and still win big by Scott Adams. Appreciate you being with me and hopefully I'll see you in the next mind map.